Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Is it loud enough here? Oh, I guess I have to get rid of it. And welcome to Yankee Air Museum's historic presentation night. Yay! I'm Jeff Bush, your host for the evening. Wait a minute. This is his script. Yeah, let's see. Uh, no, I'm not Jeff Bush. I'm Lori Day, his wife. Um, today, Jeff is in his happy place. He's uh, flying above the clouds somewhere. And no, he's still with us. Uh, he's just <laughs> flying a Citation II uh, to New Jersey and back, and he's just not going to make it in time. And so uh, he asked me, the wind beneath his wings, he might call that a lot of hot air, but you know that causes lift, right? <laughs> so I'm covering for him yet again. So how many people, this is how the script goes, are here for the first time? Aha, awesome. Okay, and how did you hear about the presentation? How did you, I saw a hand over here. Yeah, those How did you hear about the presentation? We're, we're email? Mem we're members, and I, I got the email on the Okay, the all right, all right. And how many of you here are not members? Oh, awesome, all members. So, as you know, uh, these events, uh, these presentation events are free if you are a member. Uh, did you know that your membership can also, you can receive quarterly copies of Approaches Magazine. I put a few over there on the, the uh, table. Hmm? They're biannual. They're biannual, I'm sorry. They used to be quarterly, right? <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> they are an awesome magazine. I tell you, there is just some really great stuff in there. Um, also, with your membership, you can get discounts on any of our flyables, correct? Yep. <laughs> Which is the B-17, the B-25, the C-47, the Huey even, okay? And uh, when we get the tri-motor fixed, that too, I guess. Membership is very affordable, and to become a member, you can go to yankeeairmuseum.org or stop by the museum retail shop or talk to Megan. <laughs> Megan also works very hard to bring us these historical presentations each month. Even though they are free for those who are members, in order to help support and continue these interesting and high quality speakers, we do ask you to consider making a donation of $5 per person. There is a donation box over there on the table and there's one out in the hall, uh, out the door. Um, so um, other upcoming events at the museum include open cockpit days this Saturday on October 9th. Some of our static aircraft will be open on display so you can get a good look inside. Rivet Like a Rosie on October 23rd, also November 20th and December 4th. Try your hand at being a real life Rosie the Riveter. Our instructor, instructors are some of our own tribute Rosies. Please check our website, yankeeairmuseum.org for more events and information. At this time, we would like to ask you to turn off your cell phones and please hold all your questions until after the presentation. Now to tonight's program, America's Local Service Airlines. It's a story about those companies selected by the Civil Aeronautics Board after World War II to bring air service to hundreds of small cities throughout the United States. Of the 13 airlines selected to provide service, none of them survive today. Our speaker tonight is Mr. David Stringer, who is the history editor of Airways Magazine. His airline career has spanned 32 years with Southern Airways, Republic Airlines, and Northwest Airlines. Maybe more. No. <laughs> <laughs> he will be around after the presentation to sign his book. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. David Stringer. Hi, 
Uh, can everybody hear me? Yep. Good. Yeah. Okay. My name is David Stringer. I go by David H. Stringer. Uh, that's great. Uh, in my um, professional life, because uh, one time I Googled my name, David Stringer. I don't know if you guys have ever done that or not. Google your own name. And you might be surprised what comes up. You see, oh my gosh, there's a lot of David Stringers in the world. So anyway, I decided I was going to use my middle initial H so people would know I'm the David Stringer who, who researches and, and um, writes airline history. Um, I'm going to talk about myself now for uh, a few minutes. Uh, I'm the history editor of Airways Magazine. I'm also a member of the editorial board of a British publication called The Aviation Historian. I don't know if uh, any of you guys or, or ladies have heard of this, but uh, it's an excellent publication based in London. Um, oops. Hello. Airways is a, is a um, bi-monthly publication. We come out six times a year, uh, distributed in 65 countries around the world via um, subscription and uh, purchase in, in uh, stores. Um, we are the only remaining airline enthusiast magazine based in the United States. There used to be a magazine called Airliners. You guys might remember that. Uh, Airliners went belly up about 10 years ago, so we're the last ones left in the States. Um, the other publication I was talking about, The Aviation Historian, is fantastic. It's a journal. comes out four times a year, a quarterly publication based in London. And it is uh, the product of two guys named Nick Stroud and Nick Oakey. They do a fantastic job on it. I encourage you. Uh, when you go home, go to their website and find out um, a little bit more about them because you might want to subscribe. I know we have a couple of subscribers in here tonight. Um, okay. I was born in Gadsden, Alabama. Now, why do you need to know that? You don't. But uh, the reason is I wanted to show you this photo. This is the Gadsden Municipal Airport. Uh, and that is a Southern Airways Douglas DC-3 on the ramp in front of the hangar slash terminal building at Gads. And I took this photo when I was about, I think, 13 years old. By that time, uh, my family lived in New Orleans. We moved to New Orleans when I was nine. Uh, and we were probably back in Gadsden for, I hate to say a funeral or a wedding or something, but uh, I don't remember why. But I took this photo, and uh, this is what we're going to talk about tonight. Southern Airways was one of America's local service airlines. And the reason for its existence was to bring air service to places like Gadsden, Tuscaloosa, um, Tupelo, and it was our way out of town for Gadsden, in, in town, out of town. We had six flights a day with Southern Airways, three eastbound and three westbound, and today Gadsden has no air service of any kind. Um, this is me at age 14. This is my 14th birthday, July 13th, 1964, and this is in New Orleans. New Orleans was a great place to be a teenager. We moved to New Orleans, like I said, when I was nine years old. Because being an airline geek, and I was an airline geek from the time I was seven years old when I took my first flight, uh, New Orleans had a big airport with a lot more airplanes, a lot more airlines to, to, uh, to hang around and, and to find out about. Um, let me see if the pointer works right here. This is something I want you to notice, is this uh, hinge right here on the door. This is. What I'm standing on is the air stair, and this air stair was created in the late 1940s. Um, it is something that was installed on all of the DC-3s operated by America's local service airlines. So the flight attendant, the stewardess, or the steward, uh, inside the cabin when, when, when the airplane came to a stop on the ramp could lower the steps from the inside, leaving the agent free to unload and load bags in the baggage compartment right here on the right. Because most of these station stops at the smaller airports were only three minutes long. The airplane would land, the stewardess would drop the steps, deplaning passengers would get off, the boarding passengers would get on. Meanwhile, the agent would uh, unload and unload bags and hand the, the uh, paperwork to the stewardess, up went the stairs, and off went the aircraft. And so like I said, being in New Orleans was a great place to be a teenager. And, and this was back in the 60s, and a few guys, I don't know if it was the same thing around uh, Detroit or wherever you all were raised, but this of course was before TSA and before you had uh, metal detectors and anything. Anybody could walk out on a concourse. You could just you know stroll out there and um, uh, if you found an open door, you could you could turn the handle and go out on the ramp and nobody stopped you because back then people weren't suspicious of other people like like you know they would be today. 
Um, so my favorite thing back then was to go to the airport. The airport was called Moisant. Today it's called Louis Armstrong International Airport. It's the same facility. Uh, there is a new terminal on the other side of the field, but um, we had some great, uh, great strange airlines serving New Orleans. This is a TACA DC-4. TACA stood for Transportes Aereo Centro Americanos, uh, TACA International Airlines. It carried the flag of El Salvador, but the company's executive offices were actually in New Orleans. And you all have seen these photos. Nobody's ever seen these photos before because I took all these photos when I was a kid. Um, there's a brand of Bach 111. Uh, as you may remember, the, the Bach 111, this came out in 1965. It was a um, competitor for the Douglas DC-9. It was a twin-engine jet. Uh, Aviateca was another airline that served New Orleans. It was the national airline of Guatemala. Um, this is a DC-6. Uh, obviously just came across the Gulf of Mexico from Guatemala City, getting ready to go back. And uh, I love this photo because uh, you can't really tell, but uh, on the, the steps there, the part that's turned up, the airline's slogan was the root of the Maya. And you see by the bo boarding door, there's the word radar. So, so uh, that gave, I guess, passengers a lot of confidence as they're boarding this airplane that's about to take them across the Gulf of Mexico to see the radar on this airplane, you know, so. Here's the United uh, Boeing 720. Um, United served New Orleans because United purchased Capital Airlines in 1961, so their routes into New Orleans were former Capital routes. This Boeing 720 is getting ready to go to Atlanta and New York. Uh, here's the Trans-Texas Airways. Trans-Texas is one of the local service carriers we're going to talk about tonight. This is a TTA, Trans-Texas Airways Convair 240, deplaning passengers in New Orleans. Notice the flight attendant. The uh, TTA called them hostesses. She's standing there with her white gloves on, deplaning passengers. Um, the uniform she's wearing was created by Neiman Marcus in Dallas. All of TTA's uniforms from the time the company started flying in 1947 up until um, it became Texas International uh, were based on a cowgirl uniform, the stewardess uniforms. They were called hostesses at TTA. So you really can't tell from this angle, but the vest she's wearing is is a, a, a part of that cowgirl uh, look. This is an Eastern Airlines Convair 440. Uh, I took this when I was like 16 years old. I remember the day I took this picture and the captain was getting off the airplane and I think he thought I wanted to take a picture of him with the airplane. I'm thinking, get out of the way, dude. I want to take a picture of the airplane. But, uh, you know, I, I humored him and took a picture of him in front of the plane. Now I love it because it kind of tells the story. It's like, you know, here's the captain getting off his Eastern Convair that probably just came in from Montgomery, Pensacola, and Mobile, or wherever. Um, New Orleans was called the Gateway to the Americas back in the 60s. It no longer holds that title, unfortunately. We had a lot of uh, flights between New Orleans and uh, Central America and South America. Uh, here you see an Aviateca Guatemala C-46 that just made its way across the Gulf. And a Viasa Convair 880. Viasa no longer exists, but Viasa was the national airline of, Ven of uh, Venezuela. So that flight was getting ready to go to Maracaibo and Caracas. Uh, United Caravelle, probably getting ready to go to Birmingham and Pittsburgh. And uh, TTA again, Trans-Texas Airways, DC-3, and you can see, it. I think that's an agent, even though it looks like a pilot, I think it's an agent with the chocks in his hand walking around the airplane. And uh, how many of you know what kind of airplane this is? Stratoliner. You got it, it's a Boeing 307 Stratoliner. So I'm a kid, I'm like, you know, 13, 14, 15, whatever. I'm out at the airport with my brother, and uh, I see this airplane land that's got four engines and a tailwheel. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, that's a Stratoliner. And, you know, and I knew that from the pictures I'd seen in books of it. So, uh, you know, you can't really tell, but there's a guy in the, sh in the shadows down there working on the, a maintenance guy working on the engine. So I walked up to him and I said, is this a Stratoliner? And I think, you know, he's probably blown away. He says, this kid knows what kind of airplane this is. And I said, yeah. I said, he says, do you want to look inside? And I said, sure. You know, so I went around and took a look at it. For those of you that know anything about the Stratoliners, only 11 of them were built. And this is the one that wound up, um, unfortunately, wound up, had its wings removed, and it wound up being a restaurant bar in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And uh, I don't know if the, the fuselage still exists today or not. Anyway, that's the end of the photos in New Orleans. Um, 1969, 
uh, I left New Orleans and headed for the University of Detroit, right down the road at Livernoy and Six Mile. And um, uh, you're probably wondering why a kid from New Orleans would want to go to school in Detroit, and it's because my other passion besides commercial aviation and transportation in general was Motown Records, and I wanted to work for Motown. Well, I never, that never happened, but uh, I wound up getting a good Jesuit education at U of D. Uh, spent five years there with a, wound up with a um, degree in history and political science, and came back to New Orleans, determined that I was gonna work in the airline industry, and this was 1974, and at the time, uh, we were still suffering from the oil embargo here in the United States. So all the airlines had furloughed employees, so nobody was hiring at the time. If, you know, if anybody was going to go work for an airline, it was going to be a, an employee who was recalled that had been furloughed. So the next best thing, I went to work for a hotel that was managed by an airline. And I don't know if you guys remember, but back in the 70s, the early 70s, several airlines associated themselves with hotel chains. Uh, Pan Am was associated with Intercontinental Hotels. United bought Weston Hotels. Uh, even American had a little chain called Americana for a while. And Braniff managed a series of hotels across its root system. And this one in New Orleans was uh, called Braniff Place. They didn't own it, they managed it. Um, and we used to put up crews overnight at Braniff Place from two different airlines, from Braniff International and from National Airlines. So what else was happening in the early 70s in the airline industry? Well, airlines were hiring men again, to be flight attendants. And occasionally, you know, when we, one of these crews would check in, the brand of crew or the national crew, they'd have a male flight attendant in the crew, and I got to talking to these guys. And I thought to myself, well, you know, I'm gonna go in the airline industry. I'm gonna be in some form of management or some kind of airline executive. And I thought, but wouldn't this be a fun thing to do for like three years or five years first, be a flight attendant? So I was too tall for most airlines, but I got hired by a company called Southern Airways in 1976. This is me, this gal, her name is Beth Hooper. Uh, we're still Facebook friends to this day. She lives in Atlanta. These are Southern pictures. Um, one of Southern's unique things was, was the company flew an airplane called the Martin 404. We bought these airplanes secondhand from Eastern Airlines back in 1961. Uh, the Martin was a twin engine, piston engine power, piston powered airplane, carried 40 passengers. Southern flew these airplanes up until the last day of their FAA certification, which was April 30th, 1978. They carried one flight attendant. I worked them a lot. Uh, here's a picture I took in Moultrie, Georgia of a Southern Martin. Um, look at the fuselage with all those dents, probably from hailstones over the years or whatever. Gosh, yeah. And then uh, this photo, I took this in Valdosta, Georgia. It was like 6.30 a.m. on a summer morning. You can just see the humidity in the air. Uh, here's the interior of a Martin 404. I took one day before passenger boarding. Passengers boarded through ventral stairs, which dropped down from the tail, below the tail of the aircraft. And it was a really a comfortable airplane. It held 40 people. Each row had a, had a big window to itself. Um, here's the photo I took in April of 78, the last month that we were flying the Martins. And uh, that really doesn't inspire confidence, does it? I took this out of the forward left cargo door. Uh, look at the paint peeling on the engine. And, and whatever this is, I have no idea. But, but that uh, looks like some kind of Jimmy rig or something. Anyway, uh, the thing about Southern's Martins is they were the very last piston-powered aircraft to be operated by a certificated carrier in the United States. Uh, and Southern flew, like I said, up to the very last day of their certification. And who was the flight attendant on the very last flight? That was me. So that's my claim to fame. I was the flight attendant aboard the very last flight of a piston-powered aircraft in service with a certificated carrier in the United States. And this is the, uh, pass these are the passengers that were on that flight. All of them were um, senior company officials, people who had been with Southern Airways since the 50s. That's me on the far right. And uh, there's a picture of me on the staircase. Uh, it was a very windy day. I didn't have time to run a comb through my hair, but at least, <laughs> at least, at least I had hair back then. You know, gosh. Uh, this is a Southern Airways photo, later uniform. 1979, Southern merged with North Central Airlines, and that formed Republic. Here we are at Republic Airlines. 1980, Republic purchased Hughes Air West. 
And in, uh, this is a Republic photo. This is in Orange County, I believe, between flights. Um, 1986 Northwest bought Republic. So here I am on a, this is a, my Northwest uniform, one of the Northwest uniforms. This is in Honolulu, I believe. And then here I am working my last flight in 2008. So that three to five years as a flight attendant turned into 32. And this like, is my last flight as a flight attendant between Tokyo and San Francisco. Um, and then when I took a buyout package from Northwest and retired from flying, I devoted myself full time to uh, airline history, research and writing. Um, I, some of you guys might know who this person is that I'm with. Uh, his name is Ron Davies. Uh, he goes by R.E.G. Davies. He is kind of the dean of airline historians. This photo was taken in 1994 at the Smithsonian. He, was, he held the Lindbergh chair at the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum. He was the curator of air transport. And I consider him to be my mentor. He was a great guy. Uh, he wrote a book called History of the World's Airlines. He wrote another one called History of the Airlines of the United States since 1914. Uh, History of the Airlines in Asia, History of Airlines in Latin America. And then he did a bunch of individual books that were um, illustrated by Mike Mayshaw, if you know who that is, a uh, great air, air, aircraft illustrator. But um, I, like I said, I consider Ron to be my mentor. Uh, he worked at the Smithsonian in his position until he was 90 years old. The following year, he passed away uh, at home in London. And then his, this, this is me with his daughters. That's Jackie on the left and Annette on the right. Um, uh, Jackie, along with a U.S. author named Chris Serling, wrote this book called Airlines Charting Air Transport History with Ron Davies, and I contributed a chapter to the book, so they're giving me a pre-publication um, copy of the book. So now we get to the book that I wrote, America's Local Service Airlines, <coughs> which is on sale in the gift shop, and if you'd like to purchase the copy tonight, I'll be happy to autograph it for you. But first of all, we've got to talk about who were America's local service airlines. What am I talking about when I say local service airlines? So let's go back to the late 1930s. Um, between 1938 and 1978, all of America's airlines were regulated by um, a government agency called the Civil Aeronautics Board, the CAB. And during those 40 years, Anything that an airline wanted to do, whether it was serve a different city or serve a new route or whatever fare they charged, it had to be approved by the Civil Aeronautics Board. Um, there's a lot of people that would say, you know, regulating transportation like that is not a good idea because uh, it, it, it stymies the free flow of capitalism. But under the Civil Aeronautics Board during those 40 years, America created the best airline transportation system in the world, both with domestic airlines and our international carriers. So in the late 30s, all these cities and towns, small cities and towns like Alpena, Michigan, and Port Huron, and Marion, Ohio, Gadsden, Alabama, Gallup, New Mexico, they started to petition the CAB and say, said, we want to be on the airline map. We don't want to be left out. And it's because the airlines were beginning to take on the same role that the railroads had shouldered in the 19th century. You know, back then, every city and town wanted to be on a railroad. If you weren't on the railroad, you know, you, your town was going to die because that was the way to get people and goods in and out of the city. So the Civil Air Knox Board decided, okay, let's investigate this. Should we create a specific type of air carrier that's meant to just serve these smaller cities and towns? And they spent a year, 1943, 1944, right in the middle of World War II, um, studying this. And they decided in 1944, with this opinion, that yes, they were going to uh, create a new level of air carrier. Um, the objective of this investigation set forth to examine extending transportation communities and localities throughout this continental the United States to which such transportation may not appear warranted under usual economic conditions. And that was the big thing. This service, this air service to these small cities was not going to pay for itself because you didn't have enough people that are going to get on an airplane in Alpena or get on an airplane in Gadsden or Marion, Ohio that are going to cover the cost of landing an airplane there 
and having it take off again, you know, the crew cost, the cost, the cost of station personnel and equipment. But once the CAB decided to do this, um, everybody got in the game. Everybody wanted to start a local service airline. Um, this is a proposal submitted by Vermont, Vermont Transit Company, which was a bus line in New England. And what they wanted to do was land helicopters at all these small towns and then land them on the roofs of their bus terminals in the bigger cities like Concord and Manchester and Boston. And of course, and the, 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 the interesting thing is, helicopters had not developed to the point at, yet where they could safely carry passengers. They, you know, the, the helicopter was still an experimental machine. Um, another company that wanted to start a local airline was the Missouri Pacific Railroad, and they were gonna form Eagle Airlines. And uh, if there's any railroad bus in here, you probably look at that and think, well, that's a map of the Missouri Pacific Railroad and its subsidiary, the Texas and Pacific. Well, this is a map of what the Missouri Pacific wanted to create as an airline because they were already operating trains and trucks and buses. They wanted an air service to serve all the cities that they, the bigger cities that they went into. So the CAB said, no, we're not gonna allow any surface transportation companies, whether it's a steamship company, a bus line, or a railroad to start one of these airlines. In fact, we're not gonna let any of the current airlines that are in existence uh, operate to small cities uh, to become one of these new um, local service airlines. We want these airlines to be completely dedicated to what they're gonna do, not beholden to anybody else. So, um, between 1945 and 1950, the Civil Aeronautics Board held hearings on air traffic in New England states, the Middle Atlantic states, the Southeastern states, the Great Lakes region, the Mississippi Valley region, the Southwest, Pacific Northwest. And each of those hearings, they picked out one carrier, one, one uh, company that they thought was the most fit, willing, and able to provide the service that was intended, which was to serve these small cities and bring air service to communities that otherwise would not have it. One of the other reasons that they wanted to start local airlines, and this was really interesting, this was kind of progressive for a government agency back in the 40s. Um, World War II was going on, and they knew that all these kids, these young men and women, who had grown up on farms and in small communities, were going off to war. Um, for the first time, they had been on a train and gone to New York or San Francisco, where they shipped out overseas, and they had seen big cities. They had seen what life was like, you know, in other places. And remember the old World War I song, How You Gonna Keep Them Down on the Farm After They've Seen Paris? Well, the Civil Aeronautics Board, the government itself, was kind of concerned, how are we gonna keep small towns vital and viable? So that was one of the reasons that they decided to create these local airlines. And the perfect uh, pairing of flights was laid out. There would be a minimum of four flights a day uh, two in the morning and two in the evening. The, the morning flight departing the small city to go to the big city to take somebody who had to do business in the big city or go shopping in the big city in the morning. An evening flight leaving the big city coming back to the small town. And then the opposite, a morning flight leaving the big city going to the small town to bring somebody there so they can do their business and they get home on an evening flight back to the big city in time for dinner. So it was kind of a way of saying, you know, if you like living in a small town, you can still do that and take advantage of, of uh, big city life and what the big city has to offer. Um, the other thing that they wanted to do was, these airlines were also called feeder airlines, and there was a reason for that. They wanted them to feed the big airlines, the trunk airlines. So in other words, somebody would get on an airplane in Lima, Ohio, or Marion, and fly to Willow Run, and then on a, on a local service airline, then here in Detroit, they could transfer to one of the major carriers, like United or Capital or TWA to fly on to New York or Chicago or Los Angeles. So these were also called feeder airlines at first. And the CAB issued 25 certificates between 1945 and 1950. Um, some of these airlines never got off the ground. Uh, some of them merged with other ones. Uh, Everything about them was experimental, and the Civil Aeronautics Board said, okay, every three years we're gonna investigate how this service went during the previous three years, and if, if you're not living up to the, our expectations, we're not gonna renew your certificate. 
Well, three of the carriers didn't get their certificates renewed after their first three-year review. But over the course of these years, it, uh, the total got shaken down to 13 carriers, and here they are. Uh, you probably remember some of these names. Allegheny, Bonanza, Central, Frontier. That's not the current Frontier. This is the original Frontier Airlines. Lake Central, Mohawk, North Central, Ozark, Piedmont, Southern, Southwest Airways, which became Pacific Airlines, Trans-Texas, and West Coast. So all of these airlines, like I said, their certificates would be renewed every, th every three years they went under investigation by the CAB. Okay, how much money did they make? How many passengers did they carry? Uh, are they operating a viable service? And, you know, their certificate would either be renewed or denied. In 1955, Congress said, okay, the only way people are going to invest in these companies is if we give them permanent certificates, if we make them a permanent part of the American uh, airline network. So in 1955, President Eisenhower signed a law that gave all of them permanent certification. And for the next uh, 12 years, these airlines all operated independently. In 1967, we lost the very first one of them, Central Airlines, merged with Frontier. But uh, in 1956, this is what they looked like. This is what the local service airlines looked like in America, the airlines we're talking about tonight. And you see these 13, West Coast, which served the Pacific Northwest, Frontier, which ran from the top of the country down to the bottom along the Rocky Mountains, <coughs> North Central, which I'm sure a lot of you probably remember and are familiar with because it served the North Central states. It came over here to Detroit. Um, Lake Central, which served basically Indiana and Ohio with routes up to uh, over to Pittsburgh and up to Buffalo. Uh, Allegheny, Mohawk, and then down in the south we had Piedmont, Southern, Ozark in the middle of the country, headquartered in St. Louis. Central Airlines, which served Oklahoma, Texas, headquartered in Fort Worth. Trans-Texas Airways, with TTA, which basically served Texas and extended into Louisiana and Arkansas. Bonanza Airlines, which operated in Nevada, Arizona, and California. And then Southwest Airways, which uh, was based in San Francisco and operated mostly within California, but also had routes up into Oregon. And those are the 13 carriers that we're going to talk about tonight. This is what they looked like three years later in 1959. As you can see, the map was filling out quite a bit. So I want you to think about it. All these cities on this map in 1959 had reliable scheduled air service with the Douglas DC-3s. Uh, and a few of the airlines by that time had larger aircraft. But every airplane that flew into every one of these cities carried at least 21 people. Uh, so most of them had 28 passenger DC-3s. Uh, every flight carried a flight attendant, which was an important thing because it's nice to have a representative of the company in the cabin with you in case, you know, you feel sick or um, you, got, you think you're going to miss a connection or you see the engines on fire and you want to tell somebody, you know. <laughs> but, uh, but, but I want you to think about it. Look at all these cities. Look up here in the upper Midwest where we are in, in, in Michigan and Ohio and Indiana. All these places had scheduled air service that was reliable. And most of them today don't have air service at all. So let's talk about the individual companies, Allegheny Airlines. Allegheny started um, as a very interesting operation. It's, it, even though the feeder airline started in 1949, Allegheny traced its roots back to 1939 on a concept called All-American Aviation. All-American Aviation was backed by the DuPont family in Wilmington, Delaware. And what they did was they created a uh, system whereby an airplane could fly down, uh, drop off a mail sack, and pick up another one without landing. And this would bring airmail service to smaller cities and towns and villages throughout the middle Atlantic states. It was, of course, an experimental operation. But the Civil Aeronautics Board allowed it to take place. This is a view of how it happened, how it took place. An airplane would swoop down low. The city or, or village would have this, these posts, like goal posts, erected in an open field. And the outgoing mail was in a container down here. The incoming mail would be dropped off. And then from a, um, a, a lanyard sticking down from the airplane, a hook would grab the outgoing mail. And this was, this was really quite interesting. It was quite successful in, in, its, in the way it worked. Um, but, you know, was it going to be economically uh, a, 
a success. Well, these are the routes that all Americans flew and from 1939 to 1945. And they served over 100, 121 cities and villages in Pennsylvania, West Virginia, uh, down in Ohio, too. Um, why was it successful? Because during World War II, from 1941 to 1945, the volume of mail posted in the United States grew rapidly because of people writing to their loved ones overseas, sending little care packages and letters to their loved ones. So there was a lot of mail coming out of these little towns. Uh, at the end of the war, the postal rate, postal revenues dropped. Uh, highways were getting better, and the post office department was investing more in highway mail service. So um, the pickup service became kind of like uh, something that was a nice. It was a nice idea, and we tried it for a while. It wasn't work. But the people at All American said, "Okay, the Civil Aeronautics Board is giving out these." Uh, feeder airline certificates, these local airline certificates, let's apply for one of those. And since they had operated a this mail pickup service successfully, the CAB allowed All American to start a feeder airline. And this is the airline with Amer All American Airways. This is a route map from 1949. And as you can see, the area they served pretty much covered the same area that their pit mail pickup service uh, covered. But this was a traditional airline landing at airports like Dunkirk and uh, Jamestown and Bradford and letting off passengers and picking up passengers. Uh, All American started advertising itself as the Allegheny Airline in preparation for changing its name to Allegheny Airlines in 1953. Here's a photo of an Allegheny DC-3 at the airport serving Parkersburg, West Virginia and Marietta, Ohio. And you're going to see several of these photos this evening because this is what I call, this is what local airlines these are, this is a local airline doing what it was created to do. This is a, a local airline's aircraft serving a small city airport, bringing, bringing scheduled reliable air transportation to America's smaller towns. Uh, this is Allegheny's route map in 1959. As you can see, it pretty much covered the state of Pennsylvania by that time. Uh, they also had a larger aircraft in their fleet called the Martin 202. This is an Allegheny DC-3 at uh, Newark Airport, Capital Airlines Viscount in the background. There's an Allegheny Martin 202. Um, this is a Convair 540. A Convair 540 was the first attempt to put turboprop engines on a piston engine Convair. So what the uh, Convair 540 was, here's another view of a 540 at Pittsburgh. A uh, Convair 540 was, an, uh, was a Convair 340 that had had its engines replaced with Napier Eland jet powered engines. Unfortunately, they weren't successful because Rolls Royce bought Napier Eland and then put the company out of business. So um, here's, the, here's a 540 in a later paint scheme. This is the 1962 paint scheme. Um, here's a shot of Allegheny Convairs. That's a 340 or 440 in the foreground. The second one's a 440. The third one's a Convair 580. This is at Pittsburgh, if you all recognize Pittsburgh Airport. Uh, here's a uh, Allegheny 580 at Newark. I love this is a George Hamlin photo. This is a great photo. I love it. You can just you can just feel the cold as you look at that that picture. Yeah, and this is this is uh, in the 70s. This is at LaGuardia. Uh, Allegheny purchased DC-9 jets. All of the local service carriers either purchased or signed leases for jets, and that's one of the reasons that they got into trouble. Um, but you can see here Allegheny's older paint scheme, the blue one, and in the background was their new paint scheme, which they would keep when they changed their name to U.S. Air. So the next airline we're going to look at in alphabetical order is Bonanza. Bonanza started out in 1949 operating a route from Reno to Phoenix. It was kind of a straight line route via Carson City, Hawthorne, Tonopah, Las Vegas, Boulder City, Kingman, and Prescott. And once again, this was a Douglas DC-3, so you had a big airplane with a stewardess on board that landed at all those small places, carrying passengers along. And this, of course, was before Reno and Las Vegas and Phoenix were as big and popular as they are today. So at first, Bonanza was not really a money maker. The Civil Aeronautics Board extended its route system westward to San Diego and LA. This is a picture in the um, San Diego, as you can tell, the home of the Convair in the background, General Dynamics. Uh, this is a John Proctor photo, I believe. 
And this too is a John Proctor photo. And this, um, you can't tell, but the the uh, the logo on the back of the airplane is Root of the Gold Strikes. So here's a Bonanza DC-3 in San Diego. Kind of a stodgy, old-fashioned paint scheme. In 1950, this is, this is their root system in 1957. Um, in 1957, they introduced a new paint scheme. What did I do? Hello. There we go. Uh, this one here, the orange, kind of an orange uh, dart that went back up the tail in the stylized B. Bonanza DC-3 landing at Los Angeles at LAX. Uh, Bonanza bought F-27s, Fairchild F-27s, for prop jet aircraft in 1959. And uh, as they bought more of this type, they started getting rid of their DC-3s. And it turned out that Bonanza was the first local service airline to get rid of all of its DC-3s. Their last DC-3 flight was on Halloween Day in 1960, on October 31st. So Bonanza issued this timetable on November 1st, 1960. Jet there fast with Bonanza's silver dart. This, they call their F-27s silver darts. And notice the jet in kind of quotation marks down there. I mean. They were turboprops. They were, they were turbine-powered aircraft, but they still had propellers on them. So, but, you know, they, they were, they could legitimately call them jet-powered aircraft. Well, somebody in their marketing department must have realized that, you know, our entire fleet consists of jet-prop aircraft now, so they issued another timetable, effective the same date, first all-jet-powered airline in America. And that became their slogan in 1960, even though <coughs> their jet-powered airplanes all had props on them. Um, the guy who was the, uh, the Bud Maytag, who was the head of National Airlines at the time, uh, which was uh, one of the major carriers in the country, he got really upset when Bonanza did this because he had wanted that to be his slogan when his airline got rid of the last of its piston-powered aircraft, which were DC-6s and DC-7s. But but Anne's legitimately claimed it, and uh, they used that slogan for several years, the first all-jet-powered airline in America. That's a baggage label, I believe. And uh, they eventually did get pure jets, Douglas DC-9s. And the DC-9 was a fan jet. As you probably know, you've heard DC-9 fan jet. Bonanza turned them into fun jets. This is a Bonanza fun jet in San Diego, probably another John Proctor photo. Uh, there's another photo of Bonanza DC-9. Bonanza in 1968 wound up merging with two of the other local service carriers, Pacific Airlines and West Coast Airlines, to form Air West. And in 1970, Air West changed its name to Hughes Air West when Howard Hughes became an investor. Central Airlines is the next in alphabetical order, and I always love Central because it's the underdog. Central was always at the bottom of the list of the local service airlines. It carried the fewest passengers. It you know, racked up the least amount of revenue each year. And why was that? It was because, you know, Allegheny, looking back at Allegheny and its route map, Allegheny was a successful carrier because it served the industrial northeast. It served big cities like Detroit and Pittsburgh and Cleveland, New York and Philadelphia. Central served Oklahoma City, Dallas, Fort Worth. It hopped around Oklahoma. Uh, the guy that uh, formed Central Airlines, his name was Keith Kale. He had the financing to start the airline, a headquarter in, in Oklahoma City. Then when the Civil Air and Onyx Board gave him his certificate, uh, his financiers backed out. So he had to find new financing. He found it in Fort Worth. He moved his headquarters to Fort Worth. And he told the CAB, the only way I'm going to get this airline off the ground is with cheap airplanes. So the CAB gave him a dispensation to start service with Beechcraft Bonanzas. And uh, so he started service, Keith Kale started service with 11 Beechcraft Bonanzas. Uh, this is a rare photo, color photo of a central Beechcraft Bonanza. And there's one, in, this is in Oklahoma. Um, the Bonanzas were of course totally inappropriate for airline service. They only held four passengers and that's if three people sat scratch, scrunched up together on the back seat. Uh, but Central quickly got rid of, was able to get rid of the Bonanzas and to, that was their root system when they first started. I mean, it, it didn't serve a lot of profit producing towns, Ponca City, Okamulgee, Holdensville. Uh, they eventually bought DC-3s, this is a Central DC-3 in McAllister, Oklahoma. Once again, a local service airline doing what the airlines were, these airlines were created to do, to serve small cities. This is Central's route map in 1957. As you can see, 
it still isn't like a jumps out at you as being an airline that you're going to fly on unless you want to go to Stillwater or Ardmore or McAlister or one of those other places there. And there weren't a lot. There wasn't a lot of population in the area served by Central. This is a Central DC-3 in Denver at Stapleton Field. Uh, Central bought Convair 240s in 1961, slightly bigger aircraft. They held 40 passengers. And then in uh, 1966, Central underwent a total rebranding. They created this logo at the top. That's called the Aerograph, that round uh, circular thing right up there. Um, they introduced new flight attendant uniforms. This is in 1966. I always thought it looked like a nun's habit, kind of, but it was, you know, it was very trendy for them. And uh, they introduced a new paint scheme. It was called Two Shades of Executive Metallic Gray. And, uh, they re-engined their Condor 240s and made them Condor 600s with uh, Rolls-Royce Dart engines. Here's a, once again, local airline doing what it was meant to do. This is a Central Condor 600 in Liberal, Kansas. The airports are in Liberal, Kansas. And like I said, think about it. These small towns, all of them have reliable scheduled air service. This airplane probably went on to Denver or, or, or took people down to, to Oklahoma City and Dallas. And yet today, most of these places don't see airplanes at all, or, or commercial airplanes at all. Frontier is the next airline in order. Frontier was the result of the merger of three of the local airlines that the CAB certificated. Monarch Airlines was one of them. The other two were Challenger and Arizona Airways. And the three of them came together in 1950. Here's an Arizona timetable on a Challenger timetable. The three came together in 1950 to form Frontier Airlines, which uh, advertised itself. It's cut off at the top. It was America's largest local service airline at the time. It extended all the way from Billings, Montana, to El Paso, Texas, serving all those cities in between. Uh, here's a Frontier DC-3 with the uh, um, feather livery, it was called. And once again, you can see the air stair doors that, that are stick, uh, hanging down from the aircraft. <coughs> the, the stairs were inside the door. The stewardess or steward would just pull them up and let them down. This is in Gallup, New Mexico. Frontier DC-3, that's a local service airline doing what it was meant to do, take passengers from a small city. These people are probably going to go to Albuquerque or maybe on to Denver. Uh, Warland, Wyoming, Frontier DC-3. And this is, this is Frontier's route map in 1959. And what's, in, what's truly interesting about this is look at the service in Nebraska. Uh, the Civil Aeronautics Board awarded Frontier 17 cities in Nebraska to serve all at one time. They gave them all these cities because the Nebraska Aeronautics Commission and the governor of Nebraska had petitioned the Civil Aeronautics Board for better air service within the state. So particularly this route across northern Nebraska, it started in Casper, Wyoming, and went to Douglas and Lusk, Wyoming, then to Shadron, Valentine, Ainsworth, Norfolk, Columbus, Lincoln, Omaha. Most of those towns did not have 2,000 people. They didn't have a population. Valentine, I think, was the only one that had a population of over 2,000. Ainsworth was like 1,700. Lusk, Lusk, Wyoming, had a population of about 1,500 people. I've been to Lusk, Wyoming. I, had the, I was lucky enough to drive through Lusk a couple of years ago. It's amazing. It is truly isolated. It's in the middle of nowhere. And, uh, but you, you drive through the downtown, and you see that you know, these small cities in the west served a different purpose than cities the same size back east because being as isolated as they were, they were the trading point for the ranchers and the farmers and the people that lived in the rural areas around, uh, around uh, those towns. Um, like I said, this route across northern Nebraska from, from Casper to Omaha caused a lot of consternation at the time. You can read about it in the book if you're interested in buying my book. But, uh, we're going to press on here. This is the first flight on that route. This is, the, this is in Douglas, Wyoming. This is the Douglas City officials welcoming the first flight, first flight airline flight into Douglas. This is in Lusk, Lusk, Wyoming. The gentleman on the left was 90 years old. He had been on the first train into Lusk. Back in the 19th century, it was the Burlington CB&Q Railroad. And now he was on the very first airplane flight out of Lusk. Uh, the gal's name, the flight attendant, is Joanne Peskin, I believe. 
But I thought that was a really cool photo. Here's this guy that had all this history. He'd been on the first train to Lusk. Now he's on the first flight out of Lusk. This is a lineup of Frontier aircraft, probably in Denver. Uh, this is a later livery. This photo was taken in Kansas City. It's a Frontier DC-3 and a Central DC-3, two of our local airlines. And once again, you know, they all flew DC-3s. Some of them started to get bigger airplanes in the late 50s. Um, another few of Frontier DC-3 in a later livery. Uh, here's a Frontier Convair 340 in North Platte, Nebraska. The next airline is Lake Central, which served Willow Run. Lake Central was founded by a gentleman named Roscoe Turner. Roscoe Turner was quite a character. He won a lot of air races back in the 30s. I'm sure most of you have probably heard of him. Uh, and he, 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 he walked around. He had carried a, he had a pet lion cub named Gilmore that he carried with him everywhere he went. He wore a powder blue pilot's uniform with you know the epaulets and gold braiding and all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, the CAB awarded Roscoe Turner a certificate to serve Indiana and Illinois uh, with, with local service routes because Turner, during the war, had trained a lot of pilots with his uh, fixed base operation in Indianapolis. Uh, Turner Airlines started calling itself Lake Central, the Lake Central Route and very quickly changed its name to Lake Central Airlines. That happened about a year after the, the airline started service. And here's a map of Lake Central in 1957. You see up there in Detroit, that's Willow Run. Uh, the route went south to Toledo. This is DC-3 again. South to Toledo, then to Lima, Ohio. And then you could either go to Marion, Ohio, or Marion, Indiana. Been, you know, east to Marion, Ohio, west to Marion, Indiana. Mansfield, look at these places. Zanesville, Dover, New Philadelphia, Portsmouth. All those places had scheduled air service, scheduled airline service back in the 50s. Uh, there's Lake Central introduced a pretty modern livery in 1957. Um, this is a Lake Central Convair 340. Here's a DC-3 at O'Hare. I took that photo when I was 16. My dad and I went to Chicago. And, you know, like I said, back then you could walk out on the ramp. Nobody cared. It's like, you know, you find an open door, you turn the handle and go out there with your little Instamatic camera or whatever and, you know, take a photo. And nobody was coming yelling at you, hopefully. Uh, Lake Central bought an aircraft called the Nord 262, which they hoped would be the perfect replacement for the DC-3. Um, and it was a French aircraft. Uh, it held 27 passengers. And it was a good airplane, except it had one problem. The engines had a habit of exploding in flight. Uh, <laughs> they had, uh, Lake Central su suffered two of those incidents. One of them, they lost a pa one passenger. The aircraft landed safely both times, but um, in one of the incidents, the uh, prop came loose and went through the cabin and it uh, killed the passenger. But uh, the Nords were grounded, the engines were fixed, they went back into service and they were perfectly good airplanes, but of course, the damage had been done to their reputation. Uh, here's a Lake Central Convair 580. Uh, and towards the end of Lake Central, Lake Central was merged with Allegheny in 1968. But towards the end of Lake Central's existence, it was, its slogan was the airline with a heart, and they started uh, painting a heart on the tail of the aircraft. The next airline is Mohawk. Mohawk was a very profitable airline because of where it operated, mostly across New York State, down to New York City, over to Boston, came over here to Detroit. Mohawk started life as Robinson Airlines. Um, and uh, this I, I don't usually like to show accident photos, and, but this one was very interesting. This was a um, it was the route of the Air Chiefs, Mohawk, the Air Chief on a dog. This is a DC-3 just after takeoff from Utica, New York, and this, I believe, was in 1949 or 1950. Uh, Robinson changed its name to Mohawk Air. They had a contest among the employees. What are we going to call this airline? Because Mr. Robinson is no longer associated with the company, and Mohawk won out. Uh, route of the Air Chiefs still. Mohawk operated a... a um, helicopter service from Newark Airport to Jenny Grossinger Field in the, Cat the Catskills, uh, Liberty, New York, for one summer. And I love it down here, if you look at the bottom, it says, uh, uh, let's see, we see it, uh, from the New York metropolitan area directly to cool, refreshing Sullivan County in less than an hour. The flight was scheduled for 59 minutes. And if you've ever been in an S-58 like that, it, it was very loud and you shook for the whole 
59 minutes all the way from from Newark to Jenny Grossinger Field. So after after one summer of operation, when Labor Day rolled around, and they looked at the statistics of how many passengers they had carried and how much money it cost them. They decided to scrap the service. But uh, just an interesting footnote to their history. Mohawk was the first of the local service airlines to buy an aircraft that was bigger than DC-3s. They bought uh, Convairs, Convair 240s, in 1955. When they were getting rid of their DC-3s, they, they kept two of them. And they used them, this is about 1960 to 62. They painted them in this gaslight livery. The uh, emblem on the tail is the emblem for Utica Club beer. Uh, the airline was based in Utica, New York. They operated these DC-3s from Buffalo to Boston via uh, Syracuse, Rochester, Utica, Albany. Um, and they dressed the flight attendant in a gay 90s outfit. She served cigars to the men, pretzels, beer, and cheese. And they called it their gaslight service. I mean, it was a gimmick, but it was really popular. It went over very well and got the Mohawk a lot of publicity. Uh, here's a Mohawk Martin 404. I took this photo at JFK in uh, December 64. Here's another photo of a Mohawk. Uh, this is a Mohawk Convair 440 with a Martin in the background. That's at JFK if you guys recognize Kennedy Airport from back in the 60s. This is a George Hamlin photo. This is uh, at Newark. This is a, a Mohawk uh, FH-227, next to it is a Bach 111. And of course, if you look closely, there's the Twin Towers being built in the background. This photo, I think, is from maybe 1969, maybe? If that sounds right. Dude, here's another photo. See the Twin Towers being constructed in the background. That's a Bach 111 at Newark Airport. Uh, before Mohawk, Mohawk went under it, merged with Allegheny Airlines in 1972. Before they merged with Allegheny, which of course was another one of the local service carriers, they introduced this livery, which they call the buckskin livery, which I don't think was very attractive, but um, that's just my opinion. North Central, I'm sure lots of you remember North Central. It, uh, it was like the biggest local service carrier up here. North Central started out as Wisconsin Central Airlines. This photo was taken at Chicago Midway. Wisconsin Central DC-3 at Midway. Um, is that at Willow Run? Yes. You have the happy landings thing? Yeah, I thought so. Yeah. And and that's North the old Yankee Air Museum right there over the crown of the DC-3. Really? Okay, cool. There you go. North Central DC-3, it will run. Uh, this is in either Brainerd or Bemidji, Minnesota. I bought this photo on eBay. Um, here's a North Central DC-3 in uh, at Chicago Midway. This is a Mel Lawrence photo, and if you guys know who Mel Lawrence is, we owe a great debt of gratitude to him because he took all these airliner photos back in the 50s and 60s and preserved them. Um, the, you can see the gentleman down here, excuse me, let's go back. The uh, agent down here is, is, is helping lower the steps. For, um, the, I, I looked up the flight number that you can barely see in the rear window here and realized this was a morning flight. This is like about 8.30 in the morning. And this aircraft has just arrived from Madison, Wisconsin and the airport serving Beloit and Janesville. And so here we are full of people from small towns coming to Chicago to do their business or connect to other flights. This is in Omaha, Nebraska. This is another Mel Lawrence float photo to North Central DC-3s. North Central's route system, about 1957 once again. This is, a, you can see from Detroit, they went to Jackson, Battle Creek, Kalamazoo, South Bend, and Chicago, and it was a very popular route. DC-3s, once again. Uh, not every flight over the route stopped at all those stations. Some of the flights went Detroit, Battle Creek, South Bend, Chicago, or Detroit, Jackson, Kalamazoo, South Bend, Chicago. Uh, and then northward from Detroit, or, or I should say westward, northwestward, to Lansing, Grand Rapids. Then across the lake to Green Bay, and then up to, to the uh, UP, up to Marquette, and then the Sioux, and Iron Mountain, and places like that. North Central introduced Convair 340s. They bought them secondhand from Continental Airlines in 1959. Uh, here's a North Central Convair 440, I believe. Uh, here's a lineup of North Central aircraft at O'Hare. That's a John Proctor photo. Here's a later photo of North Central aircraft. Now you can see a couple of DC-9s 
in there with the Condor 580s. That's at O'Hare also. Uh, North Central eventually bought DC 9-30s. North Central was a very successful local service carrier. Some of these airlines, a few of these airlines were really successful. Most of them did not make a lot of money and were subsidized heavily. So the next one we move on to is Ozark. Uh, I love that logo. I mean, you just don't see logos like that anymore, do you? Ozark Airlines. Uh, Ozark started out, the Civil Aeronautics Board made a lot of awards to a guy named Oliver Parks, who ran the Parks Air College in East St. Louis, Illinois. Um, Parks did not start any of the services that the CAB authorized him to, and the cities that he was supposed to be serving, all these small cities and towns started to complain. And uh, it turns out Parks was trying to, to, well, just to put it politely, he was trying to make money off the deal in a shady manner. So the CAB finally said, you know, we're taking away your certificate and we're going to give it to Ozark Airlines. And he said, wait a minute, wait a minute, we're going to start service. And so he did. He operated for about two months. This is a Parks Airlines DC-3. But the CAB said, sorry, too late. We're giving your certificate to Ozark Airlines. <coughs> And as the story goes, Ozark's first DC-3, this is not the first one, but the first DC-3 said Parks Airlines. They bought it from Parks. They took off the P and put an OZ in front of ARK and took off the S and it was became, you know, then they had their own aircraft that's marked Ozark Airlines. Ozark also had to hire most of Parks' staff because uh, Parks had hired the pilots and, and was pretty much ready to get up and running, so Ozark hired the Parks staff to get them in business. I love this photo too, I can't think of the gal's, gal's name, this is 1953, this is an Ozark stewardess who obviously had a, you know, a portrait done of herself, but I love that uniform, it was green, that was Ozark's color. Uh, here's an Ozark DC-3, uh, location unknown, but once again a local service airline doing what these airlines were created to do, uh, serving people in small town America, bringing them to the big city, in this case probably St. Louis or Chicago or, or Kansas City. Ozark DC-3 at Chicago Midway. Uh, this is Ozark's root system in 1957. It was headquartered in St. Louis, but as you can see, it did its job serving all these small towns, um, Cape Girardeau, Owensboro, Jefferson City, Moberly, Missouri, Kirksville, all with DC-3s. Ozark bought Fairchild F-27s. This is a ramp shop showing an F-27 and a DC-3. And I love this photo too. This is this was an. There's a, a guy named R. Dean Denton who is responsible for saving the Ozark archive. And uh, what happened down the road was after deregulation, TWA eventually bought Ozark. And when they did, TWA threw out all of the Ozark material, all of the photos, the historical items. And this guy R. Dean Denton, a friend of his, went dumpster diving and saved all of this material. And this is a photo taken about 1957 of the Ozark ticket counter at Lambert Field in St. Louis, Missouri. And, uh, and you really can't make it out, but the young man in the white shirt in the background, behind him, the board says Central Airlines. And that was the other local service carrier that served Lambert Field in St. Louis at the time. So you had the Ozark ticket counter and the Central ticket counter right next to each other. And I just think, it, like I said, I think it's a great photo just because it kind of tells the story. Uh, here's an Ozark F-27, I think at O'Hare. Ozark Convair 240, that airport terminal in the background is Peoria, Illinois. Uh, here's an Ozark Martin 404. Ozark FH-227, that's a company photo. And uh, here's a, a ground photo at uh, O'Hare in Chicago, two DC-3s and an F-27. And then Ozark also eventually bought Douglas DC-9s. This was their last livery here, which I'm sure some of you have ever seen. Uh, the next airline we're going to talk about is Pacific. Pacific started out as Southwest Airways. It was founded by an interesting guy named Leland Hayward. Leland Hayward was a um, Broadway and Hollywood producer, and he was married to Margaret Sullivan, the actress. And in 1940, at Chasen's Restaurant in Beverly Hills, he and a buddy decided we need to start an organization to train pilots because the U.S. is going to enter World War II. Uh, we, we know it's going to happen, so let's, let's start training. They bought some land in Scottsdale, Arizona. They built an airport. They called it Thunderbird Field. 
It's today Scottsdale Municipal Airport, but their logo was the Thunderbird, as you can see. They call themselves Southwest Airways. They were so successful in training pilots for the military, so many thousands of pilots, that they opened a second airport called Thunderbird Field Number 2, north of Phoenix. After the war, of course, you know, pilot training is done with because all the guys are coming home, so they applied for a certificate to start a local service airline, and the CAB awarded one to them. They started Southwest Airways, headquartered in San Francisco. That's a Southwest Martin 202. Uh, they changed their name to Pacific Airlines in 1958. There's a Pacific DC-3 landing in, uh, at LAX in Los Angeles. I think this is a George, uh, excuse me, a Mel Lawrence photo. Uh, Pacific bought F-27s, turboprop Fairchild F-27s. Um, and then uh, right towards the end, before Pacific merged with Bonanza and West Coast to form Air West, they flew Boeing 727s. They were actually waiting for the 727s which was still in development, and so in the meantime, they flew a couple of 727s up and down the Pacific coast. Piedmont Airlines is the next one. Piedmont was headquartered in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, founded by a guy named Tom Davis. There's a Piedmont DC-3 in Asheville, North Carolina. Piedmont F-27 in Charlottesville, Virginia. Here's a Piedmont Martin 404 in Asheville, North Carolina. And who took that photo? I did, 14 years old. My family was on vacation in the Smokies. And of course, whenever we went on vacation, I'd beg, oh, can we go to the airport? Please, 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 you know? And so we went to, you know, my dad was very accommodating. We went up to Asheville Hendersonville Airport and took a picture of this Piedmont Martin 404 and this photo of two Piedmont 404s on the ground at the same time. One thing I haven't mentioned so far that you can probably see in this photo is you look on the right side, see that second Martin 404 back there? The engine is still running. When these airplanes, when these local service carriers landed at small town airports, they always kept the starboard engine running, the engine away from activity. All the activity is taking place on the port side, the left side of the aircraft. The passengers are boarding, the agents are unloading cargo and baggage and whatever. But nothing was happening on the starboard side, so they just kept that engine going for the three minutes or five minutes that they were on the ground there. I mean, it, it certainly uh, uh, saved time and money. Uh, Piedmont bought a Japanese aircraft called the YS-11. Here's a photo of a YS-11 in uh, Washington National, Reagan National, with, uh, of course, the U.S. Capitol in the background. Uh, another odd aircraft that Piedmont bought was the Fokker F-28. Piedmont also merged with an airline called Empire, which was based in New York State, that also flew F-28s. So it had quite a, well, it was quite a fleet of the type of the uh, F-28s. Next one is Southern Airways, the company that I went to work for when I was a near 25 years old. This is Southern's first flight, June 10th, 1949, from Atlanta to Memphis via Gadsden, Alabama, Birmingham, Tuscaloosa, Tupelo, Tuscaloosa, Columbus, Mississippi, Tupelo, and then on to Memphis. Uh, Southern started out with mail flight attendants. A lot of the local service carriers carried mail flight attendants at first because when they were in flight, they could go back and sort the luggage that was getting off at the next station, which would, of course, save time for the agent, you know, at the next station, whether it was Gadsden or Tuscaloosa or wherever. But after a couple of years, they realized that uh, most of their passengers would rather have women in the cabin. This is Southern's first female flight attendant stewardess class, uh, 1951, I believe. This is Southern's route system in 1957. Um, Atlanta was the headquarters, and you can see the routes going down through Georgia, down to Jacksonville, Florida, down to Eglin Air Force Base, up to Memphis and Charlotte, and then down the Mississippi Valley to New Orleans. A local service airline doing what it was meant to do, a Southern DC-3 in Greenwood, Mississippi. And uh, this is Chattanooga, Tennessee, Lovell Field in Chattanooga. Uh, this is the interior of a Southern DC-3. I think it was the only interior shot I have in this presentation. But this gives you an example of what it was like. I mean, you, you guys have seen the C-47 out here, um, you know, with the bucket seats along the walls. This is, this is uh, the, the DC-3s originally had two plus one seating, and then most of the airlines after the war added an extra row of seats, so it was two plus two seating, and they made the, the aisleway a little narrow. But those seats were still very comfortable, a lot more comfortable than the seats you come across today. Um, if you look up on the forward bulkhead, there are these three slots. Every pilot and every uh, stewardess carried their name in on a little metal bar, and they would slide them into the slot. 
your captain is so-and-so, your first officer is so-and-so, your steward is a so-and-so. And very important for down south, look at the uh, fans in the overhead bin. These were not air-conditioned aircraft or pressurized aircraft. DC-3s were, were unair-conditioned and unpressurized. So you know, those fans did a lot of, a lot of work. Um, this is Southern's first Martin 404 flight into Columbus, Georgia. This is Dothan, Alabama. This is Southern DC-3 in Memphis. And then Southern DC-9s also, like, uh, like most of the other local service carriers. And then this was Southern's final livery before we merged with North Central in 1979. And I personally think that's one of the nicest airline liveries I've ever seen. Um, we called it our flight mark logo and, and livery. Trans-Texas Airways, we're getting near the end. This is the next to last, TTA. Um, where we were talking about the cowgirl outfits at the beginning, this is TTA's first stewardess class. Uh, they had the vests and the ties on. And I think what's interesting is this was the, the, the gal on the left here that's the standing on the ground. That was the instructor. That was the chief hostess. But what I think is interesting is look at the boots. They're all different. So they probably said, go out to the shoe store and buy your own boots and we'll reimburse you or whatever because they all got, you know, very individual pairs of boots. This is a timetable from 1950, yeah, and you can see the Calgary uniform more complete. And I said, over the years, as the uniform changed, they kept the cowgirl theme. Uh, they just uh, updated it a bit. Here's some TTA DC-3s in the first livery. This is what this is what their root system looked like. Once again, all DC-3s back in 1950, <coughs> serving great places like Corsicana, Palestine, Fort Stockton, Alpine, Marfa, Van Horn. Um, in 1953, the Civil Aeronautics Board allowed TTA out of Texas for the first time through Louisiana up through Arkansas to Memphis. And then I love this livery. This is one of my first, my favorite aircraft liveries. Look at the amount of paint on that airplane. You have Fly TTA. At the front, you have Super Starliner, which is what they were calling their DC-3s at the time. Above the boarding door, you have Trans-Texas Airways. It's repeated again on the tail along with the Texas Lone Star. You have red, blue, even on the wings, you've got uh, Red and blue paint. I mean, that's a lot of paint on an airplane, but what a cool livery. TTA bought Condor 240s secondhand from American Airlines. Um, here's a photo in Dallas at Love Field of a TTA Condor 240 and a central DC-3. Uh, TTA re-engined their Condor 240s and made them Condor 600s with Rolls-Royce Dart engines. And uh, this is an interesting picture because when they bought jets, you look at that uh, livery, and all you see is TTA. You don't see Trans-Texas Airways on there anywhere. And on the engine, it says TTA Pamper Jet. They call their DC-9s Pamper Jets. But they were trying to get away from the Trans-Texas Airways, uh, the, the, idea, the notion that they only serve Texas. So they wanted to just be known by their initials, TTA, which was probably not a very good idea because people made up all kinds of funny names to go with TTA, like Treetop Airways and Tinker, to <laughs> Tinker Toy Airlines. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. There's a TTA DC-9, and uh, TTA changed its name to Texas International Airlines uh, and adopted this purple and gray livery and put it on their Condor 600s also. This livery lasted about four years until a guy named Frank Lorenzo bought TTA, bought Texas International, you all sure remember him. Um, the one good thing he did was change the delivery back to this, the red, white, and blue, and put the Lone Star back on the tail. Uh, Texas International Condor 600. Uh, TI bought DC-9s, and here's a lovely photo at Houston Intercontinental Airport of three Texas International DC-9s. Our final local service carrier is West Coast. I flew with Paul Bunyan's airline. And West Coast was founded by a guy named Nick Bez. And all these airlines, most of them have characters behind them. People that founded them uh, stayed with them as their president and their developer over the years. And just like Eastern Airlines is, uh, is, no, is known for Eddie Rickenbacker, Delta for C.E. Woolman, United, Pat Patterson, most of these local service carriers uh, had their own personalities at the helm. Well, Nick Bez, was a guy who was born on the Dalmatian coast. He came to America 
uh, the first decade of the 20th century with supposedly just a dime in his pocket. He made his way to Seattle where there was a Dalmatian community and went into fishing and became the largest salmon canner on the West Coast and then eventually uh, started this airline, West Coast Airlines, which ran up the West Coast from Bellingham, down the West Coast from Bellingham all the way down to Medford, Oregon. West Coast purchased another one of the local service carriers in 1953 called Empire. And for one year, they called themselves West Coast Empire Airlines, although West Coast was the surviving carrier. And the company served, by that time, Oregon, Idaho, and Washington State. Again, a local service carrier doing what it's supposed to do. This is a West Coast DC-3 at the airport serving North Bend, Oregon. Uh, Yakima, Washington. West Coast was the first airline in the world to fly the Fairchild F-27. Um, it was, of course, the turboprop airplane. They introduced him in 1958. Uh, here's an F-27 over the uh, Washington Mountains. F-27. This photo was taken in Baltimore, Maryland. And if you're wondering what a, F, what a West Coast F-27 was doing at Baltimore Friendship Airport, it's because the Fairchild factory was in Hagerstown, Maryland. And um, this being one of the first F-27, the first F-27 to go in service in the United States, it was starting off on a publicity tour around the country. So here it is on its first stop in Baltimore. Uh, West Coast DC-3 in an undisclosed location. Here's West Coast route map in 1959. As you can see, they've expanded down to Salt Lake City and San Francisco and east to Great Falls, Montana. Uh, a later livery, which I consider kind of boring. It was kind of a black stripe with a little blue uh, tone of blue in it. West Coast purchased DC-9s. And then towards the end, before West Coast merged with Pacific and Bonanza, they bought these Piper Navajos and introduced them on service to Roseburg, Oregon as an experiment. And like I said, this, this is, is kind of one of the things that um, uh, people didn't want. You know, the thing about local airlines flying a DC-3 or an F-27 or a Convair, you are on a big airplane with a flight attendant on board. You get on a small airplane like this, it's kind of like it's not uh, confidence inspiring. But West Coast experimented with these and um, people flew them. Uh, when West Coast merged with Pacific and Bonanza, they changed their name to Air West. Here's a West Coast DC-3 and Air West livery. And this is 1967. This is what the local service airline map looked like in 1967, the last year that all 13 of these carriers were independent. And look at all those cities that were, uh, that had reliable scheduled airline service back then. That's the end of the presentation. Um, uh, you might say, what, what, what killed the local service carriers? There were four things that, that were primarily responsible. The first nail in the coffin was in 1956, one year after President Eisenhower had given uh, permanent certification to the locals. The following year, he signed into law the, the Interstate and Defense Highways Bill, which was responsible for creating the interstate highway system that, of course, we all know today. And once the interstates were built, people had an option. You know, okay, I can drive the 60 miles to the big city airport or the, or the 80 miles or whatever without having to rely on the airline schedule. <laughs> um, the second nail in the coffin was subsidy. Uh, most of the service to these small cities was subsidized. And when the Civil Aeronautics Board started the local service airline experiment, the way it was supposed to work was over time, as more people took advantage of these local airlines and people in the small cities realized that they had this kind of air service, the more people that would be flying them, the more revenue they would generate and the less subsidy would have to be paid out. Well, more and more people did start flying them, but the subsidy bill, the, the subsidy bill kept going up, and that's because expenses were rising faster than, than income. Uh, the third thing that was a nail in the coffin were jets. In order to compete, all these airlines felt with compete, you know, to to stay on par with the big airlines, they all felt they had to buy jets. Most of them bought DC nines. Uh, some of them bought Bach one elevens or Boeing seven twenty sevens. And 
They have a lot more seats to fill now, plus they had a big bill to pay. These jets were expensive aircraft. The last thing that was the final nail in the coffin of the local airlines was deregulation. In 1978, when President Carter signed the Deregulation Act, airlines basically had free reign. They could do anything. They could go wherever they wanted to. And these local service carriers decided, well, you know, we're tired of serving these podunk towns. We want to, you know, become a national carrier. So people like, companies like Ozark can expand it with coast-to-coast -coast service via St. Louis. Southern Airways, the company I said, like I merged, worked for, merged with North Central and then acquired Hughes Air West. And we became a nationwide carrier. But anyway, the purpose of the book and the purpose of my being here is to just emphasize to you what we had at one time. This is what America had. Would we need something like this today? Probably not, because the character of small cities has changed a lot. Uh, but at one time, this is what was offered to the American citizens living in small cities and rural towns around the country. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be glad to take them. I want to let you know the book is on sale. It's in the gift shop. It's at a discount. And I'll be in there happy to sign it for you if you want to buy a copy. Um, does anybody have any questions? In Tomatoes, a couple of years ago, there was something called Essential Air Service. Is that an offshoot of this? Essential Air Service is what was created when the Civil Aeronautics Board was disbanded, and it was created by the Department of Transportation. Uh, Essential Air Service is, says there are certain communities that we're going to provide air service to and subsidize air service to, but it comes nowhere near covering the number of cities that were covered by the local is it airlines. still in place in some yes. cities? Mm -hmm. okay. It is. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, two questions. One were, uh, did the local service airlines have the same rules like TWA did where flight jets had to be single? Oh, yeah. And then the second was, how would they build a fare across several states? How would they build a fare across several states? How do you mean, like from? Let's say from Grand Forks to Washington, D.C. Well, you have your fare on, on North Central from Grand Forks to Minneapolis or Chicago, wherever, and then you'd add that to the fare from Chicago to, to Washington on Northwest or wherever you were flying from Chicago to Washington. Um, and we'll get that out of the CAV book? So all the oh, yeah, yeah. I'll just go into a book and find all the fare in this. Exactly, exactly. And it's funny because I'm very fortunate to have started flying early in life because my dad learned about the family plan. Uh, and I don't know if you guys have seen like old timetables from the 1950s. They had, most of them had ads on the back of them saying, uh, if you fly between Monday noon and Thursday noon, the, uh, the breadwinner, the husband, can take his wife. He pays full fare, but he can take his wife and his kids all at half fare. So my family was four people, my mom and dad, my big brother and myself. So my dad would pay a full fare and he'd pay half fare for my mom and half fare for me and half fare for my brother. So basically, we would travel you know, wherever we were going for the for the cost of two and a half full fares. So um, I got to fly a lot when I was a kid and in my teen years. So I'm very fortunate for that. But uh, yeah, that's how they would they that's how they would construct a fare. They would take the fare of the local service carrier between whatever your hometown destination was and, and your hometown airport was and the connecting point, and then the fare of the connecting carrier. Yes, sir. I saw uh, the Purdue airline when it didn't make the cut, apparently. Uh, they never started operation under their certificate. They, so, so Purdue Airlines finally did get started. It was run by Purdue University in Lafayette, Indiana. And they finally got underway uh, as a charter carrier later in the, in the 1950s. But they did not, uh, they were not a, a local service airline, even though they had a certificate to provide local air service. How long did, did that last under that name? Sure, they're considered one of the non scats the uh, supplemental airlines. But uh, they flew jets, though, they flew DC 9s. Yes, sir. Was Allegheny the only one to start the, uh, the commuter system, like Allegheny Commuter? They were the first. They were the first. They started Allegheny Commuter in 1967 between uh, uh, Hagerstown and Baltimore. So, what, what Allegheny did was on some of their smaller routes, uh, that were not generating a lot of traffic, they, they subcontracted the service out to commuter carriers that flew smaller airplanes, and they called it Allegheny Commuter. And that actually was the start of what today is the uh, code sharing of like 
uh, United Express and Delta Connection and stuff like that, airlines like that, where a big airline like Delta will use a smaller carrier to, uh, to uh, fly smaller airplanes into, into less uh, profitable markets. Yes, sir. Yes. Um, the aircraft that you discussed tonight, which aircraft had the best safety reputation and which one had the worst? Now, that's an excellent question. I mean, you know, the DC-3 was a very popular airplane, a very safe airplane. One thing about the locals is, in general, they had a great safety record. Uh, of the ones I showed you tonight, probably that Nord 262 had the worst, you know, the ones with the exploding engines in flight. Um, but, yeah, the DC-3 and the F-27 and the Convairs, they were all good, sturdy airplanes. Yeah. Yes, sir? Where did most of the pilots come from? Were they World War II vets? At, at first they were. They were World War II vets. I used to fly with a lot of World War II vets when I started with Southern. These guys were... You know, they were reaching the, uh, the end of their careers, but uh, they had all started, they got their training during or before the war, and then when the war was over, they got hired on by these um, local carriers. Yeah. Anyone else? Yes, sir. I, I heard this story, <coughs> I don't know if it's true or not, but could you address the origin of the term fly by night? <laughs> yes, I could. Fly by night was uh, the term given to the non-scheduled airlines, the supplemental carriers. And it's a whole different uh, topic, so I'll, I'll keep it really brief. Uh, after World War II, a lot of servicemen were coming home there to train as pilots. And they wanted to get in the airline business. Well, there were not enough airlines, certificated airlines by the CAB, to absorb them all. So some of these guys became their own entrepreneurs. They started their own airlines. Uh, most of them were charter flying. They'd say, you know, okay, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll fly you to Kansas City, we'll fly you to Chicago, and they'd, they'd buy a secondhand war, su war surplus DC-3 or DC-4, C-54, Skymaster, and they operate against the rules of the CAB. The CAB tried to shut them down. But most of them would operate at night because, you know, if you landed at an airport at three in the morning, there was nobody there to collect a landing fee. <laughs> you know, so, yeah, they, they, were, they were not known for safety, which is a shame because there were a few really good non sketch Transocean Airlines, USLA, United States Overseas. They were excellent carriers, but there were a lot of really shoddy non sketch I'm doing a book about them. It should be out next year. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. I appreciate it. Yeah. I <laughs> Last minute, the book is, the book is in the gift shop. Out of this time. Thank you very much, David. We have outstanding presentations like this one on the first Wednesday of every month. However, we will not be having one in November. Mm -hmm. But on December 1st, uh, we will be resuming again. We have Dr. Mike Barger, best known for his leadership as co-founder of JetBlue Airways and an accomplished former chief instructor at the Navy Fighter Weapons School otherwise known as Top Gun. He'll talk about his best-selling book, High Stakes Leadership in Turbulent Times, Why Stakeholders Are the Greatest Assets in Good Times and Bad. What's that? He's focusing on Top Gun, I'm sorry. The book will be for sale, but the speech is about Top Gun. Ah, okay. Sorry, Lori. All right. Top Cruise. So, so really the focus is going to be on top gun. Okay, uh, that should be awesome. Please remember the donation boxes off to the side and in the hallway are hungry. Your small support truly does go a long way. Thank you for coming out tonight and until next time, as Jeff would say, bye-bye and bye-bonds. See ya.